Well, good morning, Gateway, and welcome back to another week of Church Online. We're so glad that you could join us. This morning, you'll see that we've had some creative fun with our set design this week. Believe it or not, we have transformed the third floor of Gateway into our new set for Church Online. You may have heard of the Crystal Cathedral. Well, this is our very own Canvas Chapel. Look, this is our 10th week online, so we thought what better time to have a refresh and inject a little creative expression into our regular Sunday rhythm. Just one announcement to let you know about. A couple of weeks ago, we launched our Gateway Christmas Appeal with Operation Shoeboxes. These were actually due back today, but given the last few weeks, we realized that it hasn't really been possible for people to pick up the boxes and make this happen. Operation Shoeboxes is such a great initiative that we wanted to find a workaround so that we could still contribute in some way. So, like with everything else at the moment, you can pick up a shoebox online. For a donation of about 30 Australian dollars, which is about 32 New Zealand dollars, you can choose who you would like to send the box to, write a letter to the child, and the box is then packed by the team in Australia and sent on its way. If this is something you'd really like to do, and we would really encourage you to do so, please head to www.occdonations.samaritanspurse.org.au That website's down here. And follow their instructions. That's it from me, but before we move into a time of worship, we have a quick update from Don. Good morning, Gateway. Over the last few months, we've all been following the news regarding COVID-19. The situation is changing all the time, sometimes on a daily basis. And to be honest with you, it's become increasingly difficult for us to plan for our gatherings with any confidence. A number of times over the last few weeks, we've anticipated holding in-person gatherings, only to have them cancelled at the last minute. It's not ideal, but it is the reality of the world we live in at the moment. That being said, we feel it's important to provide our community and our volunteers with some direction on where we're heading with our in-person gatherings over the next little while. The leadership team has made a call to suspend in-person gatherings and continue with Church Online for the next four weeks, irrespective of any alert level changes during that time. This includes Sunday gatherings, weekly prayer meetings, Crave, young adults and so on. You can imagine we haven't taken this decision lightly, thinking about the people for whom gathering together is a lifeline, a time that offers connection, worshipping together in community. And we know that in times of crisis, we need the community more than ever. But it's important that as a leadership, we take time to carefully consider government advice and how this affects us as a faith community. You will appreciate that there's no easy answer or one size fits all response to the challenges we're facing. So we need to be prudent and wise and this will take some time. So even though we won't be gathering in the building, we do encourage you to connect online and when it's safe to do so together in your homes. We'll be taking the next four weeks to thoroughly work through government regulations and how they impact us moving forward. If you have any questions about that decision and how it affects you, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Email us at office at gatewaychurch.org.nz and we'll do our best to respond to you as soon as we can. Thanks, Tom. Now, let's worship together. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way Cause He hung up on that cross And He rose up from that grave My God's still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's 
We could try to count the stars You already know them each by name And every single galaxy Was your design, your majesty displayed Glory shines before our eyes. The more we see, the more we love you. King of wonder, we stand amazed. There's no other, other than you. again it's uh, lovely to be with you um, it would be much better in person but um, things are the way they are and we're grateful that at least we have the technology available to us to be able to come from where we are to where you are we've been dealing over the last couple of weeks uh, in the passage uh, that has to do with Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 and we are looking at the character of Joseph and the dreams that God placed in his heart and how those dreams unfolded over time. What I'm suggesting is that Joseph provides something of a template of how God deals with the dreams that he puts in our heart. We, like Joseph, are beloved of the Father, favoured and clothed and destined to bear rule and opposed by the powers of, the, of this age for all of the above. Now last week we looked at the source of Joseph's dreams and then the course of Joseph's dreams. And we saw that the source of Joseph's dreams were divine. We call them Joseph's dreams, but in many respects he was simply the recipient of them. They were God's dreams for Joseph's life. I suggested that although we are all different and God doesn't turn out chocolate soldiers, nevertheless, in the unfolding of a dream, we do negotiate similar territory and similar tests as those dreams uh, play out and I suggested that there is a recognizable course to the unfolding of our dreams. Birth, death and resurrection is a very familiar pattern in the outworking of dreams. Because of that the course of our dreams will be generally very different than we anticipate. When we first uh, 
uh, are aware of our dreams, we trust that they, are the, that they will develop uninterrupted and that the graph will go uninterrupted up and to the right. However, God intends that he develop in us a character that is equal to the assignment that he gives us. To have a dream without the character to live successfully in it is to invite disaster. And we all know that a person's gifts can take them to a place where their character can't sustain them. And God is too good a parent to let that happen. So in order to develop the required character to allow us to live successfully in the dream, God allows tests and trials and difficulties to come our way. In addition to God's purposes, we have to realise that there are broken people and wicked spirits that are invested in ensuring that our dreams never materialise. So the combination of God's testings and the devil's attempts at destroying our dreams mean that sometimes our dreams can go in a course very different than we anticipated and that at times they turn into nightmares. Joseph dreams that his brothers bow down before him, but in reality they rise up against him and throw him down in a pit from whence he is taken and sold as a slave into Egyptian captivity. Now from God's perspective, if Joseph had ever had eyes to see, those pits and prisons are a classroom in which he is being schooled and forged into the man of God that God will need in order to stand successfully in that rather large dream. In those classrooms, we need to understand that what God does today will make sense tomorrow. What we painfully learn this year will be an education we will appreciate next year. And that everything that unfolds in this part of the dream is a preparation for something that's coming. From Satan's perspective, these pits and prisons provide the perfect opportunity to turn Joseph from his dreams and to leave him cynical, disillusioned, bitter and broken. Now while Joseph's experiences, his life, are literally a world away from most of ours, I suspect we will be able to recognise that some of the obstacles that he faced in the unfolding of his dream will be very similar or are very similar to the ones that we also face in the unfolding of ours. Over the next few weeks, I'd like to look at some of the obstacles that Joseph faced and how he dealt with them, trusting that you and I might be able to learn something from him as we encounter situations that are somewhat similar. The very first obstacle that Joseph faced in the unfolding of his dream was perhaps the one he might have expected least, it was the opposition that came from his own family. Uh, not dissimilar, actually, to Jesus, who faced the similar kind of opposition from his own family. John chapter 7 talks about his siblings and their unbelief of his messianic calling. It turns out that family resistance is not that unusual. In fact, Jesus said often the gospel will bring a sword as opposed to something that we might have anticipated. Perhaps it's our parents whose response to our dream to be a musician, an actor, or perhaps a youth worker is a comment along the lines of, and then a stance backing up that comment, that those are hobbies, not, not a real job. Get a real job. Sometimes the fiercest opposition that we face may come from a disgruntled spouse whose comment is, I don't care if you get religion so long as you don't go overboard with it. And their defin definition of overboard is getting more excited than they are. Let me say something here, though, by way of balance. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't listen to voices of people around you, people that are close to you. On the contrary, you do need to hear their voice. We don't do this journey as independent travellers, but we do it in community. And this talk isn't intended to give permission to independent rebels who've made up their mind to do whatever they want to do in spite of sometimes the wiser counsel from other people. We have to find a place of balance as this unfolds. In this story, however, the irony is the ones who stand most to benefit from the fulfilment of Joseph's dreams are the ones who oppose him and the dreams the most violently. As we'll see later in the story, and as most of you know, Joseph's dreams put him in a position from whence he is able to prevent his brothers and their families' starvation. And I've watched similar scenarios unfold many times, where those who stand most to benefit from the fulfilment of a person's dreams are actually the ones who oppose them the most stridently. 
I wish I could stand before you and say that your dreams are safe in the family of faith, safe in the church. They should be, and some they are, but not always. Mine certainly weren't. My dreams of pastoral ministry were resisted and battered almost to death, not by unsaved outsiders, but by a saved insider, my own pastor. I've told the story many times and I've written about it, so I don't intend to repeat it on this occasion. Sufficient to say that he purposefully resisted me and my hopes very strongly, and it's not that unusual. A friend of mine who had a significant and very powerful prophetic voice was publicly mocked and humiliated by his pastor when he shared his dreams of being a prophet. And one wonders what motivates such opposition. Perhaps the answer is multifaceted, but at least in this instance, in Genesis, we are told. Genesis 37 verse 11 says, his brothers envied Joseph. And that's reiterated in Acts chapter 7 verse 9, when Stephen, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking about Joseph's story, says, moved with envy, they sold Joseph. Envy motivates people to do terrible things, and it is more common than we would like to admit. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 4 in the Living Bible says, Then I observed that the basic motivate, motive for success is the driving force of envy and jealousy. I think the preacher in Ecclesiastes was a very profound observer of, of humanity. It was envy that moved the Pharisees to deliver Jesus up to crucifixion. Both Matthew and Mark record that in their Gospels. For he knew, Pilate knew, that it was because of envy that they had handed him over to them. That says, that's found in Matthew chapter 27 verse 18 and Mark chapter 15 verse 10. What is this dreadful thing called envy? I think envy is actually the fruit of a deeper inner issue. Envy is the visible manifestation of a deeper inward problem. I think envy is the bitter fruit of an insecure soul. Lloyd John Ogilvy defined envy as the insecurity of an unstable state of grace. You see, we only envy other people in the proportion that, and to the degree that, we are not secure in that special place that God has given us. We tend, like Joseph's brothers, to see life in zero-sum economic terms. Zero-sum is an economic term that basically says gain is offset by equal loss. So, in other words, if I want to increase the budget for the youth department, then that increase must be offset by an equal loss from another department. In other words, if I win, you lose. Joseph's brothers saw life in, in zero-sum economic terms. They saw life, if you like, as a solitary pie, and they saw Joseph getting the lion's share of that pie. Their understanding was then that they were going to end up dividing the leftovers among themselves. And that's how an insecure person views life. If somebody else is flourishing, <coughs> excuse me, then somehow it's considered to be at their expense. The insecure soul can't appreciate that God actually doesn't work with zero-sum economics. What God does is give every single person a pie, every single person a dream. The fact that somebody else might be getting a large section of their pie doesn't lessen yours. Insecurity and the resultant envy is always heightened when the person who is flourishing uh, is gifted in and called to the same field as the insecure soul. Now, I might not be tempted to be insecure and envious regarding a, a chemist or her, uh, perhaps a historian, but if you sat me down with a very successful pastor, my response might be revealing. Karen and I, I remember, sat in a room one time where two very prominent prophetic individuals were introduced to each other, and the resulting verbal joust was fascinating to watch. Put two musicians together, or two bodybuilders together, or perhaps even two beautiful women together, and observe what happens. I say the last phrase because I recently read where one very beautiful but obviously profoundly insecure woman was talking about what happened when she entered a crowded room. 
The first response, she said, uh, was that she checked out the room not for strikingly handsome single men, but she scoped out the room for other possibly beautiful women. The reason, she said, was I wanted to know who my opposition was. Will I, who is it that I will feel envious of and perhaps have to pay, uh, play second fiddle to? When we are driven by insecurity, we are quite unable to follow through on Paul's injunction to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, found in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. The insecure individual, at least on the inside, does the very opposite. When the fellow soloist fluffs their lines or their piece of music, inwardly, at least, we smile gleefully, even though outwardly we might say, well, never mind, dear, there's always another time. Our disappointment at missing out on a position at least can be softened by the fact that our rival missed out on it as well. We all know the pervasive feelings that accompany envy and insecurity. Os Guinness says, Envy will not let into its heart the notion that those who excel can ungrudgingly be given our admiration and respect without diminishing ourselves. The envious person, he says, is moved first and last by his own or her own lack of security. Driven by deep insecurity and the resultant envy, Joseph's brothers become dream destroyers. They sought not just to destroy his dream, but his very life. And Saul did exactly the same to his young prodigy, David, for the same reasons. Saul is probably the most graphic study in scripture of the impact of insecurity both on oneself and on others and from the moment the maidens start singing about David's exploits Saul's insecurity bubbles up and unchecked leads him to try like Joseph's brothers to kill the young dreamer unchecked insecurity inevitably does this it may not result in actual murder, but it is destructive nonetheless and seeks to murder and destroy dreams. This profound insecurity explains why some of you work for employers who are relationally and verbally abusive. It's why some of them need to be what I call the biggest dog in the kennel. They don't mind the presence of other dogs, but they have to be able to bark the loudest, jump the highest, and run the fastest. And in their insecurity, they will humble and humiliate anybody who seems to know more or perform better than they do in certain areas. And the, the boss will perhaps turn on the young IT genius rather than admit that he or she knows more than they do or is more creative than they are. Again, ironically, in destroying those young dreamers, the boss destroys the very one who has the potential to rescue or advance the boss's long-term interests. Jesus' disciples manifested their insecurity in the constant battle for preeminence within the group. They were constantly fighting over who was the greatest. And that insecurity comes to a head in John 13 at what we call the Last Supper. And it stands in such marked contrast to the profound security that Jesus manifests in the same situation. We all know the story. They came into the Last Supper and nobody would be the foot washer. The foot washer was the most menial task performed by the most menial member of the ancient household. And none of the disciples would stoop to do it. In their perverted performance oriented thinking, to do menial was to admit that you are menial. And also, I think there's the issue of whenever there's the trouble over being the greatest, there's always the haunting spectre of being the least. I think some of us say, well, I might not be the greatest, but by God, I'm not going to be the least either. So all of them avoided the foot washing task. Jesus taught them a memorable and weighty lesson. And it says in verse 3 of John chapter 13, Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, put on an apron, and then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. Jesus, secure in his father's love and certain of his father's faithfulness, rose from the table and embraced the task that the disciples had so studiously avoided. Jesus' identity was rooted in what God had said to him and about him. 
At his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father's voice had furnished for him a clear core identity experience. And secure in being the Father's beloved son, he did not need to strive for position to prove who he was. No task, however lowly, threatened his identity. He didn't need to stretch for greatness, he already had it. And being inwardly great and inwardly secure, he could stoop in servanthood. You know, stretching for notoriety and stooping in servanthood are antithetical. You, ha you can do one, but you can't do both. Leaders who need fawning assistance, green rooms, car parks, perks and offices to prove their worth, I suspect are actually too emotionally hungry to be safe in leadership. Leadership opportunities should never be used to find emotional wholeness. They are meant to be opportunities to express it. Leaders are called to be servants. They are the means by which God intends other people's dreams to be fulfilled. Not the, not the means by which they are derailed and ultimately destroyed. So secure leaders can become space makers. They give room for budding dreamers to arise. Insecure leaders are space deniers. They are like the large tree in the forest that deny the young seedlings under their shade light and moisture and nutrients from the soil and so ensure that those young plants are never in competition to the parent tree. It's quite perverted, really. Where does the security that Jesus manifested come from? Where, where do we find ourselves being made secure? Well, the answer is in knowing that we are loved. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 in the Amplified Bible says, May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, settle down, abide, and make his permanent home in your hearts. And may you be rooted deep in love and founded, may you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. Security comes from the awareness that we are loved by the significant people in our lives. And there is no one more significant than the Father. You know, if you look back in that passage in John chapter 13, you'll notice a key word repeated several times, and it's the word know or knowing or knew. Jesus knowing, Jesus knew, and as a result of that knowing, uh, he was able to do the task that the disciples refused to do. He knew who he was and how the Father felt about him. He'd heard his Father's voice. He, uh, he was aware of his Father's verdict. And he lived in and for that audience of one. What others thought about him was incidental. What the Father thought about him was formational. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is with his disciples and he asks them, he says, who do, who do men say that I am? And then following that question and the disciples' answers, he said, who do you say that I am? Now, Jesus didn't ask those questions out of some nail-biting anxiety. He was actually probing the disciples' understanding, not expressing some deep insecurity in his own heart. But those questions made me think about the crucial formation of our identity. And I'd like to ask you this morning, who have people said that you are? It's a crucial question. People have made pronouncements about you, about me. Fathers, mothers, siblings, teachers, employees, employers. Their affirmation or perhaps denunciation can massively impact, uh, affect the uh, the unfolding of our destiny and impact us for either good or ill. Somehow, at least growing up, we seem to hear the negative voices much more than the positive voices, and we hear people saying, ah, he's good for nothing. She's stupid. He will never amount to anything. She's a plain Jane. He's a plodder. And we can respond in several ways to what other people have said about us, and hence the next question, who do you say you are? Some people simply agree with the estimates that have been pronounced over them by those significant people, and they live out the self-fulfilling prophecy. Others, on the other hand, aggressively set out to disprove the verdicts that have been made about them and end up striving, driven personalities. Neither position produce wholeness or deep security. 
Can I suggest to you that the final question that I'd like to put in this little sequence is the most important question of all. Not what do others say about you, not even what do you say about you, but thirdly and finally, what does God say about you? Who does God say that you are? What others say and even what you say about yourself is, inc is incidental. But what he says about you is destined and determined to be formational. You know, we really need to hear his voice. And primarily that will come from the scriptures. I asked Karen if I could tell this story, but when we left the church that I mentioned earlier in my talk, where the pastor was pretty brutal on us, Karen came away, like me, battered and bruised. And she felt that she could actually never do enough to gain God's approval. We lived under a constant barrage of, you're never quite doing enough. If we prayed one hour, you should have prayed two. If we read 10 chapters of the scriptures, we should have read 15. If we had witnessed to one person, in actual fact, we should have witnessed to three. So Karen came to this place where she'd opened the scriptures and all they seemed to say to her was, you're not good enough. You, you, you haven't done enough. She determined at one point in the journey after we left that church that she was going to go through the New Testament and underline everything that God said about her. And over a six-month period proceeded to do that. And the results were transformational because rather than feeling she never measured up, she saw the things that God said about her. The same kind of things that he had said to Joseph. The same thing that he said to Mary. Hail, highly beloved one. You are accepted in the beloved. You're a person of significance and there is something that I've put in your life that has to do with the dream that I want to unfold. That, that experience was really transformational for Karen. And there are some of you who are watching today, listening today, who maybe need to take a similar journey in the profound deep insecurity that blights your life and affects not only your dream but has the potential to be impacting on others' dreams also. Maybe you need to take time where you go through the scriptures and, like Karen, find out what it is that God says of you. Sometimes it will come in an experience, as it did for Jesus on the mountaintop. There are times in our journeys where we have those mountaintop experiences and we are profoundly impacted by God's love. Without the awareness of that love, security and identity will always be at the mercy of other people, of our success or failure. We need to be rooted and grounded in love. When we are rooted and grounded in love, we become the kind of people through whom dreams can happen. And we become the kind of people that encourage other people's dreams. Other people have got dreams too. I think of Mary and Elizabeth both pregnant with miracle children, both surrounded by the cynicism and negativity of, of people who, looking at the circumstances of their pregnancy, had things to say about them. But both Mary and Elizabeth company together. The Bible says they got together and for a three month period, they walked with one another, encouraging each other in their experiences and in their dreams and in carrying God's seed. And you may be a Mary, pregnant with God's purposes, but you need also to be an Elizabeth to another Mary. Rather than being in competition, wouldn't it be so good if the family of faith was a place where dreams could flourish? They can, they should, and I long and pray that Gateway would be a place where that happens. Hey, God bless you guys. So thrilled to be with you again. Hope to see you soon. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing 
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness is running God it's running God is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, your goodness is running after, the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us today, Gateway. As we close, please lift your hands and allow me the privilege of speaking the blessing from number six over you and your families. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. May the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you always, and until he comes, Amen.